Hi, the purpose of this video is to give you a simplified overview of glycolysis. Uh, this is by no means exhaustive, uh, but it's to give you a general idea of how glycolysis works to provide your body with ATP during exercise. So we're going to start off looking at a muscle cell. So this represents the, the muscle uh, cell membrane. And inside we have the cytosol or the sarcoplasm. And glycolysis starts with a glucose molecule. And so here we have a, a six carbon glucose ring. And that glucose gets taken into the cell uh, by mechanisms involving insulin. We'll talk about that later. But once it gets into the cell, it is converted to something called glucose 6-phosphate. And the way it's converted is by an enzyme. That's what this gray arrow represents. An enzyme that uses ATP uh, to use the energy to put the phosphate on top of there. So you take a phosphate off of the ATP, put it on the glucose ring, and now you have glucose 6-phosphate. At that point, you have a, a decision to make. Your, your, your glucose can now glucose 6-phosphate can either be used for storage to use for later or you can use that right away to produce ATP. If you don't need the energy right away it's going to be converted into glycogen. So that glucose 6-phosphate now goes up and is stored as glycogen or a bunch of little glucose molecules hooked together uh, within the muscle. And then once you need that glycogen, that glucose again, the glycogen is easily broken down, back down to glucose 6-phosphate, and then you go down uh, and can utilize that. If you, once you get that glucose 6-phosphate, if you need that energy right now and don't want to store it, you can actually use that glucose 6-phosphate and go through a couple of steps. Every arrow here represents an enzyme. Uh, through a couple of steps, that glucose 6-phosphate can be converted down to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So it's still that glucose ring, but now it has two phosphates on it. And one of the enzymes responsible for that is fructose, phosphofructokinase, or PFK, right here. Now, PFK uses an ATP <clears throat> and puts that phosphate on the, the glucose ring, the carbon ring. Now notice the whole point of glycolysis, right, is to get ATP produced. Uh, but so far we've actually used two ATP. We used one ATP to get glucose 6-phosphate. And now we've used a second ATP to get it down to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. All right, so in this case we have to invest ATP to get ATP back. So we're investing two, but in the end if everything goes well we should get four in return, so we would net two. Now here's one of the, the tricks here with glycogen, right? So let's say you eat your glucose, you have a big spaghetti dinner, and you, your body takes in that glucose into the cell, you're, you're sleeping, you go to bed, so you don't need to use that glucose 6-phosphate right away, you put it into storage. Then when you go and exercise running to class early in the morning, you start to use that glycogen, you go straight down. Right? You've already made that investment of ATP, you don't have to make it now. So you, you use that ATP when you're resting, when ATP isn't scarce, and now you have the glycogen, and so you only have to invest one ATP from glycogen. So it kind of saves you some energy in the long run. So if you start at glycogen, you only have to invest one ATP from there, whereas if you start from glucose outside of the cell, you're going to invest two ATP. And that'll become clear in a little bit when we talk about the net gains of everything. So phosphofructokinase is important because it's the rate-limiting step in glycolysis, one of the major enzymes that determines how fast or slow glycolysis proceeds. So if the enzyme's activity is upregulated, glycolysis will co occur quickly. If it's, if it's slow, it'll co go slowly. So this was the investment phase. We've invested two ATP. Now we're going to start getting some ATP back for our efforts, right? So the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate is broken down into two, three carbon chains. Um, and now we, so we split it into half. Half goes on to the left side, half goes on to the right side. And everything's going to be identical of what happens on each side. 
So now we, this, this three carbon chain uh, needs to get rid of some hydrogen and electrons and to go to the next step. And to do that, it donates the hydrogen to NAD+, which is an electron carrier, which then becomes NADH. And then that NADH is actually going to go down to the mitochondria eventually and be used for aerobic metabolism. But before we get to that, so we're at the three carbon chain. You go through one step, one enzyme breaks it down, another step happens, and in the next step, you take an ADP, and energy is actually released resynthesizing that ADP back into an ATP. So now we've gotten an ATP back, but it's happened on both sides, right? We got it from this three carbon chain and that three carbon chain. So the two ATP we invested in the beginning have now been made up for, we've gotten two back. So anything that we get, any ATP we get from here on out, we're going to be in profit, right? It'll be more than we started with. So we've gotten two, and then you do a couple more steps, and you get another two ATP, one here and one here, uh, back. So now we've gained two. So we invested two here, and we've gained four back. Uh, so negative two plus two plus two. So the, the net is a total of two. And then it ends at pyruvate, right? So this glucose that started off as a six carbon ring or chain is now as a three carbon pyruvate is one of the end products <clears throat> in order for glycolysis to keep on going this NAD has to be available uh, if it's all saturated as NADH if all your NAD carriers think of it as like a bucket right if the NAD bucket is already full with hydrogens, it can't take any more hydrogens, and so this can't proceed. So one of the things that has to happen is this NADH has to get rid of its hydrogen somehow. And one of the ways it does it is through aerobic metabolism. And during in aerobic conditions, when your mitochondria are, are available, up and ready and free, that NADH produced at this step, or this step, will go make its way down to the mitochondria and donate the hydrogen and electron to the mitochondria to become NAD again. And then that NAD makes its way back up here so that it can keep the cycle going on. If the NADH never went down to the mitochondria, you'd not, you wouldn't have an NAD back here to receive the hydrogen and electron at this step and you couldn't have glycolysis proceed. So the aerobic metabolism allows the glycolysis to proceed. Now there are times where you're trying to produce energy faster than the mitochondria can handle, right? The mitochondria are good for producing a moderate level of energy or ATP at a very sustainable level. But let's say that you need energy ATP really fast. And so what you can do is take that NADH and instead of taking the long trip all the way down to the mitochondria in a process that takes a while, you can take that NADH and actually have it donate the hydrogen ions down to the pyruvate. So it just dumps the hydrogen ions back to, onto pyruvate, which then becomes lactate. And then the NAD makes its way back up to accept more hydrogen ions. So here we have an empty bucket. We fill it with the hydrogen ions. You've got to dump those hydrogen ions somewhere. So when you're going super fast, doing high intensity activity, like running a, a, a 400 meter sprint, you don't have time for that NADH to really diffuse all the way to the mitochondria and then come back. So what happens is that NADH makes its way just to the, the, lac, the pyruvate down right next to it, donates those hydrogens on, gets rid of them, becomes the NAD, empty bucket, comes back up to accept the hydrogen so this process can keep on occurring. So the lactate allows you to have glycolysis occur at a more rapid rate. But as we'll learn, the trade-off is that when you have the pyruvate, pyruvate has a lot of energy left in it. And if you're donating the hydrogen ions onto the pyruvate, you're kind of discarding a little bit of that energy. Ideally, the pyruvate would make its way to the mitochondria, and once in the mitochondria, that pyruvate can be used for a lot of energy. Um, so 
if we just if we don't go to the mitochondria with that pyruvate, we're just doing anaerobic glycolysis, we gain a total of two, we net gain or we profit two ATP. But if we can take that pyruvate eventually down into the mitochondria, we can profit a total of somewhere around 36 ATP. It's a slower process, more of a long-term investment, but it gives us a lot of ATP back in the end. Whereas if we need a lot of ATP right away, uh, we go with this process where we take the NADH, donate it to the pyruvate to make lactate, and then just keep recycling really quickly. We don't benefit from all the energy of the pyruvate right away or it, because it becomes lactate and the lactate will diffuse out of the muscle. Uh, what we'll learn in the end is that the lactate, when it diffuses out, you can actually, it can actually go to a nearby fiber uh, and be used in the mitochondria there. So the lactate from one muscle can diffuse into another muscle cell, be converted back up to pyruvate, and then go to the mitochondria. So lactate isn't a, it's not completely wasted, but it's not used um, during very intense activity. Our key points to other key points to think about. So when you start with glucose, you have to make that initial investment and then you can decide if you go to storage mode or to utilization. If you've stored it as glycogen, let's say, you, like I mentioned earlier, you had that spaghetti dinner yesterday. When you went into storage mode, you, you spent that ATP yesterday. So that now, when you're about to run your race, if you start at glycogen, you don't have to make that investment. So when you start from glycogen, you actually profit three ATP instead of just two. So it can be more beneficial, give you more energy that way. Uh, that's all we'll cover for now. We'll talk more in class later.